Good morning and welcome to Ordinary Life, which is an educational offering of St. Paul's United Methodist Church. And the first piece of news is that because of Laura, we reschedule Michael Moorwood and he will now be with us on a webinar on September the 10th, which is Thursday night, not this Thursday, but the coming Thursday. And I keep stressing the webinar is free, but you must register in order to get a link to the Zoom webinar Im yes. invitation. Yeah. And we now have over 200 people. Yeah. This yeah. is good. That's and I've said in the previews and the summaries that go out that if you go to YouTube, you can see the presentation that Michael did here last year, and that will sell you mm -hmm. on coming yeah. back. He's great. Yeah. He's great. Yep. We did not, the, the, the webinar team, which is actually assembled mostly here today, agonized about what to do, so we decided not to do it, fearing wind damage, taking out power lines. We did not have a drop of rain in yeah, Houston. we dodged from a the, bullet. From Laura. Yeah. Our, my, my heart for sure goes out for the folks in East Texas and Louisiana, but um, we dodged a bullet. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. And has uh, the uh, podcast with yeah. Dr. Jeff McDonald aired? So this week we had Jeff McDonald on our podcast, who's a senior minister here at St. Paul's. Um, some good scoop in there about what the possible outcome of the United Methodist Church is and uh, just generally good discussion. So go to our website, find it through our website or through podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and have a listen. Just joining us in the in-between is... Uh, and I'm going to pass the offering plate around. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'll put my <laughs> fake money in. Your virtual contribution. Yeah, right. um, there is a way to contribute to ordinary life. One of the ways that we use the money that gets um, contributed is to d donate to nonprofits here in the Houston and even beyond Houston area. Um, this year we've done some COVID response and uh, have really appreciated the generosity of those of you who have contributed and are able to do really good things with the amount of generosity we have collectively in this class. So you can do that online by going to our website, clicking on the donate button, which is at the bottom of every page, and it'll take you to a form where you can fill out and just insert ordinary life in the memo. So thanks for, thanks for considering that. Anything else of announcements? I don't think so. So everybody is a pajama person these days. Mm -hmm. You wore a tie today. I did. Mm -hmm. I thought I would dress up. Yeah, you bit. look sharp. Yeah. Got a beard trim. Got yeah, a beard yeah, trim. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Trying to look better. As I said, when the content is weak, you have to distract people. Which is why I'm casual today. My content's amazing. It's powerful. <laughs> <Yeah. Just kidding. laughs> and any, anyway, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, we are so glad that you're spending part of your time to this day uh, with Ordinary Life. And I, I have a request because um, <clears throat> some of the stuff that we're going to say today is edgy. How unusual. <laughs> we never push buttons. <laughs> Stick with us till the end because uh, I'd like you to hear it all. Um, Marcus Borg was on a television program once, and before the television program aired, he was told that he would have a minute and 15 seconds to answer this question. What was Jesus like? And this is how Marcus Borg answered that question. Jesus was from the peasant class. Clearly, he was brilliant. His use of language was remarkable and poetic, filled with images and stories. He had a metaphoric mind. He was not an ascetic, but world-affirming, with a zest for life. There was a socio-political passion about him, like a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King. He challenged the domination system of his day. He was a religious ecstatic, a Jewish mystic, for whom God was an experiential reality. As such... Jesus was a healer, and there seems to have been a spiritual presence around him like that reported of St. Francis or the present Dalai Lama. And as a figure of history, Jesus was an ambiguous figure. You could experience him and conclude that he was insane, as his family did, or that he was simply eccentric, or that he was a dangerous threat, 
or you could conclude that he was filled with the Spirit of God. Marcus had such a gift. Mm. Okay. So seeing that we are going to be spending much longer than we had anticipated doing these live stream presentations, Holly and I decided a um, couple of months, three months ago, that we were going to frame this period of time going forward uh, by using Buddha and Jesus to guide us through this time of pandemic and now racial issues of racial justice. And our hope is that we would emerge from this time with new eyes and, and see things differently, that we will have a deeper understanding of the fundamental injustices that are either often unnoticed or willfully ignored by the powers that be in our culture. Now, I personally don't believe that positive change and progress happen automatically. I think they come by intentional choices and sustained commitment to action for things to be different. Such choices lie at the heart of what it means for us to live our lives with compassion and humility and inclusion and justice. Now, before the pandemic came upon us, I'm thinking when Holly and I actually began co-teaching on March the 15th, we thought that these times would last mm. a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And now it's stretching into months and months and we really have no idea when this is going to end. And even at that time, before March the 15th, our country was already in a dangerously polarized and divisive place. And at the time, I saw that the forced stay-at-home orders as an opportunity for not only a new kind of monasticism, I'm an idealist, a romantic, right. but, <laughs> but also for an opportunity for us to imagine what it would be like for us to become more unified and committed to reimagining and rebuilding a more just and healthy nation. Both Jesus and Buddha call for us to demonstrate love for our neighbor and to practice building communities of empowerment. One definition of insanity, which I'm sure you have heard, is to do the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. If we were on the Titanic and the ship were sinking, we have to do more than just rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. We have to do something different, and we have to do that different differently. Our country is broken and we have to mend it. We have to mobilize hope. We have to mend the fabric of our society. So we're undertaking using the teachings of Jesus to help us in this. More specifically, we're going to use the teachings found in the Sermon on the Mount. And the one that we're up to today, and I was tempted, Holly, to jump to the very end of the sermon. Mm the story of the men who built houses, one on sand and one on rock. Yeah, that's a great, great parable. It's a great, yeah. it, it's a great parable, but it, it, it's a way to frame the entire three chapters in Matthew. But we're going to go through these beatitudes like they are, like ladder, rungs on the ladder yeah. going up. And next week we're gonna talk about how to survive the loss of everything and everyone you love. Yeah. But first. But first, we'll talk about. <laughs> there is this one. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want to read that same passage to you, this time from Eugene Peterson's translation. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. And this is what he said. You're blessed when you are at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and God's rule. Now, there is no reputable biblical scholar who believes that one day Jesus went up a mountain and actually said all the words that are in the three chapters in Matthew. Um, 
The Sermon on the Mount is found in its long form in Matthew and a shorter form in Luke. In Luke, it's called the Sermon on the Plain. Um, it is both Matthew and Luke take their material from a source that we no longer have. Scholars call it Q. And I also believe that they take a lot of their material from uh, the document that we call uh, the Gospel According to Thomas. Sometime I'm going to teach about the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, you know, that would be a great idea. Maybe spend a year or two doing it. <laughs> You're blessed when you end of your rope. Yeah. That really hit me because mm -hmm. that's how I feel. Yeah, there, so my husband Josh does a podcast and one of the things they said on it was, we're hanging by a rope off of a cliff. Did, and, you know, that, that, that image is true. We are. We've kind of gone off the cliff and we're hanging by a rope. So, before March the 15th, uh -oh. I, did, um, I did most all of my writing um, with using my desktop computer, I mean my, my iPad, because I would be um, here at the church writing, and I don't have a big computer here, but since then I've stayed at home. I've got a big monitor on my desk and I write using that, and uh, I'm a seven on the Enneagram, so the space around my desk is chaotic. I believe in circular filing, all piles on the floor. <laughs> all that Organized stuff chaos. drives my beautiful bride crazy. But next to the computer, I have my iPad, so I can check for references and yeah. do that sort of thing and have it easy. And this past Wednesday, uh, I was writing on the, working on this, and uh, I have a, uh, and keeping Zoom appointments. And it, it, when the breaks would come up, I would switch on my iPad because I have an app on there called Direct TV, and it would allow me to check in with a local television station that was broadcasting updates on the hurricane. Mm -hmm. So I would see it coming closer and closer to us. By this time, we'd cancel that Thursday night. and. Uh, I turned it on one time, and I got an image of uh, the video that had just emerged showing uh, the shooting of Jacob Blake. And I felt assaulted. I think that that colored the next 48, 72 hours. I, mean, I wept when I saw it. I, I, I just was, that's the kind of thing that when people see, they get PTSD. Kids are seeing this, this is going to make me cry, kids are seeing this stuff in seconds after it happens on their iPhones. So we think about this um, generation of kids who are growing up with these traumatic images available to them right away. And the amount of trauma or tension in their bodies is very real. And... I have read both sides of thinking about the shooting now. Why police shoot so fast, so many rounds, why they're trained or not trained leads to this. The training does and does not lead to this. Why they don't take a second to think about another possible outcome. And of course, immediately there are protests. And then there are protests against the protest. Mm -hmm. And um, John Pavlovitz, who is an evangelical social activist of the stripe of um, uh, Sojourner's guy, Jim Wallace, he tweeted this. The way to prevent 100% of police brutality riots is for cops to stop beating and assassinating black people. So the divide deepens. And as we were preparing for this time today, I was joking with Holly before this Wednesday um, about how could we get into this teaching about blessed are the poor or poor in spirit without turning people off, right? Richard Orr says that the surest way not to draw a crowd is to advertise that you're going to do a seminar on peace and justice. Nobody will come because mm -hmm. nobody wants to hear that. Add racism to that, and we've like, oh, <laughs> right. So depending on whether you read Matthew, blessed are the poor in spirit, or Luke, blessed are the poor, 
Peterson's version really speaks to me. Blessed are you when you are at the end of your rope. We've got to do more than rearrange chairs on the deck of the Titanic. We have to mend the fabric of society. I love this graphic. I got it from Sojourners Magazine, and um, I, I just, um, I believe that the teachings from the Sermon on the Mount give us a good road, roadmap about how to proceed. Yeah. I'm passing that over to you. Yeah. <laughs> so as we get into the meaning of blessed are the poor, it felt important to spend some time illustrating the social structure of the time in which Jesus lived in order to draw a thread between then and now. The religious and social structures are somewhat similar to the religious and social structures that we currently live in. So as humans moved from a more compact cosmos, which means that God is embedded in the world and that human and the divine, humans and nature were completely accessible to one another. Um, and toward a separated, what we might call a three-tiered universe, oops, that went fast, <laughs> um, that where heaven is up there, the earth is flat, upheld by some kind of pillar or underworld is one story, the earth is a flat plane that sits on the backs of turtles is another story, or sits on the head of a snake. These are all indigenous stories that emerged and sort of heightened this idea of a three-tiered universe. Hierarchies and distinctions were deepened as we uh, sort of acknowledged or uh, related to the world in this, in this way. And those who had access to both a religious enlightenment and social security became fewer and fewer. The three-tiered universe is this kind of flat earth theory. The diagram, of course, shows the one that's being held up by pillars. The success of the modern Christian church is that it made God universally accessible so long as you have Jesus. In other words, Jesus took the place of what we might say is the one ruler, which we'll see in a minute. Institutionally, the church became socially exclusive. So if we think over time of those who have been left out, LGBTQIA community, women, African Americans, in ways that the American church justified slavery and segregation, homeless, uh, yet Jesus supposedly said, the only way to the Father is through me. But it wasn't in order to place him at the top as the ruler. It was a way of saying that through him meant that on the other side of that door was a multitude of people. And those who were historically left out were welcome in that space. It's like he used this kind of mind trick, follow me, but when I open the door, you'll see all these people, all these misfits in a way. And the thing is, is that the misfits, as it were, remain the majority of the population. The regular folk are the people that Jesus identified with, not the aristocracy. So we want to, you to know that we know that we're giving a profoundly mixed message today. <laughs> um, on the one hand, we need to uh, and want to speak to healing. There's so many hurting people, hurting for so many reasons. The, the crisis that we're in is deep and it's thick and it's complex. And regardless of how anybody feels about this pandemic, and I know it's been politicized, mm -hmm. the facts are, and facts are true, whether you want them to be or not, whether you agree with them or not, the fact is that the virus is spreading. Our hospitals are full, people are dying. And as marvelous as our medical capabilities are, we've not yet found a cure for, for the virus. I was scheduled to do a wedding in West Texas this coming month. Mm -hmm. And there is a regularly updated map. I, if I think of it, I will put the link to this map in the summary that goes out. It shows the state of Texas. And you can click on a county and it will tell you what the risk rate is at the moment of contracting the virus in that county. Hmm. So I went on the, on the website. Now, the wedding I was going to do was in San Angelo, mm -hmm. which is way out there and not, it's big area. Yeah. You know, yeah. people are, live far apart. Risk rate in that county, 98%. Mm. 98%. 
I forbid you to go. Huh? I forbid you to go. I'm not going. <laughs> well, it's been rescheduled anyway, yeah. but I, I, was, I was not going to go. And not at my age and with coronary artery disease, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I don't think we yet know what the economic consequences of this turndown are. I'm hearing now of more and more people uh, losing jobs, not having jobs, being laid off, not being able to find jobs. Uh, owners of small businesses, particularly restaurants, shuttering their doors with no plans to reopen. Um, I'm not talking about just people who have back of the restaurant jobs or, or menial jobs. I'm talking about people who are owning the restaurant. I mean, I talked to a doctor the other day who was quite concerned that their entire practice would go out of business. Mm. For the, mm. um, we, we have a system of justice or injustice that's revealing almost every day how people of color are treated differently than white people. And what that has left us with as a society is a population of people who are actually so vulnerable from illness, from lack of income, from lack of being treated fairly, from lack of justice. And in this society, built as it is around economic well-being and a religion of consumerism, when the economy falters at any level, people feel disoriented. Mm -hmm. It's in this context, blessed are the poor. So um, as far as the crisis in the justice system, what we have on both sides of the matter, both conservative and progressive, are deep wells, I mean deep wells of anger and deep wells of fear mm. on it both hurts. sides. Say pain, huh? pain. So I, I think one of the great questions of this time is whether the people in charge, and this is old white guys, mm -hmm. you gotta remember that we are in a, still a, that's one of the shadow aspects of our, our entire world, but certainly of this country, is the shadow aspect of white male patriarchy that runs the show. You're my shadow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sadly yeah. true. Yeah. You know, I, I, I lucked out in being born. I, I had nothing to do with the fact that I was born to white, middle class, upwardly mobile people in, in this country. I got gifted with that. No, it was just... Well, I think that's where we come to the blessed are the poor. What we're, you know, what we have to acknowledge is that that's not, we need to let go of that idea that that's lucky or uh, better than, right? We have to shift this idea of a hierarchy. And that's, I think, what Jesus' teachings are trying to do is up, up, upturn the hierarchy, upturn that idea that any one of us is more special than any of the I other. I was people. born into a privileged position. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I want to sketch this out for us in real time, um, how this society was constructed and the radical move that Jesus was trying to make, one that I think we're still being called to make and we're grappling again with how. So Jesus lived in this world. God is out there above the world. I love this image of God dangling the earth from a string as he creates the cosmos. So this is the whole cosmos that, that God is dangling from a string and kind of drawing as he goes. Um, I, like Jesus, want to radically question God as the creator of the cosmos and place God among it, inside of it, and really in the very marrow of existence. So I did this drawing, and I want to just kind of walk through it as we go. The social pyramid funneled into a single point and was separating way. How'd you do this? I'm amazing. You are. <laughs> um, there's one person at the top. God is like above it all. God is out there above it all. There's this one person at the top that is usually a ruler, a king, or a queen, or a pope. Today, it might be any one person or institution that wields too much power. Something like our devotion to capitalism might be that one thing at the top. The top 1% are the governing class. Um, these nobles and officials who surrounded or, or catered to the ruler, if you will. Today, these top 1% are the, are the billionaires, those who hold, I mean, what did we just say? Jeff Bezos is worth $200 billion. He's on track to become the first trillionaire. I made a joke about it. Yeah. 
What Jeff Bezos has a net worth $200 billion. Yeah. Yeah. That's an expensive net. An expensive net, right. So <laughs> when we think about the, that top 1% and we think about what it is that we worship, 17 of the top 25 wealth holders in the whole world are white American males. They control or own most of our industries. The next 5% in Jesus' time were called the retainer class, those who maintained the system. So these were the military, the scribes, and the teachers, the lawmakers in um, Jesus' time. They were generally against Jesus because he resisted the very system that they worked so hard to write into being and to maintain. So Matthew, as one of the gospel writers, was, um, was known to be a converted scribe, that he once existed in this 5% and then sort of what do you want to say? His eyes were opened. And he realized that upholding the system meant denying so many in the population. Today, this percent of the population are successful entrepreneurs, investors, or inheritors of wealth. This fourth class, also about 5%, were the merchants. Today, most of our society is merchants, but the, um, these were a specialized group at this time. And the fifth class, also about 5%, were the priestly class. And at that time, the priests owned most of the land. Um, that, so participating in the priesthood mean you land wealthy. That's still true for the Catholic Church, right? Owns so much of the land in so many parts of the world. Today, these fourth and fifth classes are smashed into what we might call the upper middle class. Um, folks who own quite a bit of land or market shares. In total, and still today, these first five classes make up about 15 to 20 percent of the total population. But it is where most of the power lies. So 15 to 20 percent or 16 to 20 percent of the population holds most of the power. You can see here who made up the 80 percent. This is still largely true today. So peasants might broadly be defined as laborers, migrant workers, teachers, those who keep your buildings and homes clean, they drive garbage trucks, perform palliative care, change people's bedpans, etc. This includes everyone from the working poor to the solidly middle class, but the income difference between the 80% is vast. The income difference between the top of the 80%, which is averaged to be about $70,000, and then the next 5% is vast. So to, to this 80%, college, Tuition, for example, is often unaccessible because the, 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 the max income at this point is $70,000 and now colleges are costing $70,000 a year. So that's, so college, a higher education, what makes one supposedly upwardly mobile becomes inaccessible to this class. So even education is being kept in that sort of top 15 to 20% and, and the system is maintained. So at the very bottom, the bottom 5%, these were called the expendables in Jesus' time. These are the ones society does not value at all. I want us to think about who these people are today. Think about the question, who do you, who do you think they are? Who in our society is considered expendable? What comes to mind for me are the homeless, prisoners, poor immigrants, black men, in some countries, it's women. The question Jesus puts on our hearts is, I um, oh, didn't mean to do that, but is, is can the top stand with the bottom? Can the, those at the top stand with the expendables? How do we become poor in spirit, in a sense, and fight for their right, not just to live, but to thrive? The poorest person in society does not have a problem with morality, but a problem with be belonging. And it's not their fault. The top 20% in society largely define who or what belongs and who or what matters. And this is what Jesus asks us to challenge. God is more likely among the 80%, he says, than confined to the top 20%. So let, yeah. me, let me interrupt you just for a Please. second. In, in that drawing that you did, that, pyra mm -hmm. that pyramid, Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan so make a, a, a big point. Can that work? Mm -hmm. I think I have to do the whole. That's all right. Keep That's okay. Talking. They make a big point out of saying that. Um, Oops. Oh! Well, <laughs> let's uh, see if we can do that on live in real life. Can I press the arrow and go back or not? Uh, you can try. Okay. We're causing ourselves. Yeah, we are. All right. Let's yeah, go back. Keep to going. That. Keep going. There we go. Okay. 
um, that, that pyramid that you drew, uh -huh. um, it, it, Marcus Borg and John Nyman and Crossland call this a brokered system. Yes. That means that if you had something to offer to the class above you, yes. you could retain your position. You're like a retainer class, right? right? So it was brokered from the top down. And that's why those at the bottom of that top part of the, like the fifth group right there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At that, at, right before you get into the 80%. Right, right. That's why they impose such harsh restrictions on the ones below them, because mm -hmm. if they didn't, then they'd move down into that 80%. Right. And this is kind of the rub today, is that nobody wants to be on the bottom. But for a society to be a compassionate society, we must identify with the bottom and with the rights of the, the most expendable in society in order to change this. So what, you know, we're again, as Bill mentioned, we're provided with this tragic example last week that is yet another call to address systemic racism, which is upheld by maintaining an elite class as normative. So the more we worship that 15 to 20%, and as I said, that top 1%, mostly white American males, then we're maintaining this structure. So last Sunday, Jacob Blake, a black man, unarmed, was shot seven times in the back in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He was shot after a call about a domestic disturbance while opening the door to his car where his three children were waiting for him. It's important to see him as his family spoke, as a father, an uncle, a son, a sibling, and yet to some, he is expendable. For some, it feels important to find a reason to justify why he got shot, and there is no justification. So let me contrast that with um, this image, the shooting of an unarmed black father, with another scenario. In the protests that followed in Wisconsin, a young white teen appeared with a long rifle. So a gun that's very visible and very dangerous. And several accounts tell of him walking right by the police with his weapon. He ended up shooting three protesters, two of whom died, one of whom may lose an arm. He was arrested one day later, and even with a gun, he, and wanted for murder, he was not shot by police. I'm not suggesting that he should have been shot. I'm suggesting that Jacob Blake should not have been shot. The contrast here is striking. And this is the rip in our fabric that we need to mend. So I don't want to send the message that all police are brutal. I think we know that, that there are good cops. I do want, and I don't understand what it's like to be a cop. I can imagine that it's a stressful job. I do want us to recognize that there have been too many killings of unarmed, mostly black, mostly men, by police who have not been held accountable. And this lack of accountability sends a message that those who have been wrongfully killed or wounded are expendable. So in an unprecedented move, the NBA and the WNBA, these are players who are admired, wealthy, elite, and now mostly black, boycotted the playoffs. Who are these people? This is, this is a WNBA team, Women's National Basket, Basketball Association. So they work hard every year, every team, to get to the playoffs. This is the pinnacle of their season. And as we know, their season has been postponed because of COVID. And now they're in the playoffs. They're in this bubble in Florida that no, no team can leave the bubble unless they've been eliminated from the playoffs to keep everyone well. And so far, it's working. But every year, they work for this, this position in the playoffs. But as this year, as a protest to the lack of accountability, they boycotted the playoffs. Among athletes, I would say the NBA and the WNBA are some of the most admired, but also some of the most outspoken against injustice. The vast majorities of the players during this season's playoffs are wearing, in lieu of their names on the jerseys, um, jerseys that say things like Black Lives Matter, Equity, Ally, I Can't Breathe. They are using their position to make a statement some of them, as I said, are so admired. Little kids look up to them. They want to be like them. They want, they aspire to attain that, that, that kind of prowess in the same way. 
Many of these folks have come from the bottom 80%, but in their position right now in the top 20%, they've laid it down with those to stand with those deemed expendable. This is how the wealthy become poor. They place themselves alongside and stand with the very lowest. This is not fascism or anarchy. This is solidarity. So the actions of the NBA players have been like a kind of murmuration among all these other athletes that Major League Baseball has joined, have made more statements. Uh, hockey, there's like, I think, eight black players total in hockey. Race car drivers, I mean, there are, all these athletes are now realizing they have a platform and they can make a statement together to, to, for, to bring about collective change. So what they're saying is we are tired. We are so tired. We're at the end of our rope. So we can't admire these guys for their success on the field or the court and then decide not to listen to them when they have something important to say. We're not basketball players. I'm actually pretty bad at basketball. <laughs> Josh says I am a really good beater of the backboard. <laughs> like my balls just thunk off the backboard. <laughs> Most of us don't have a huge fan base. I certainly don't have people running around with my name on the back of their jerseys. But the challenge here is to ask us, the regular folks, where do we stand? How can those of us in the top tier of society stand among the 80% who are not? How can we do reparative acts to disrupt the power structure, to bring God? So here's our power structure again. How can we bring God, as Jesus did, into the world among the least of these? Jesus wanted to upend this system. He wanted it to be more like this an open system where God is not out there, but God is right here between us and as he, as I think Richard Rohr wrote, as available as water in the river. This is a radical move, not just for today, but a radical move for when Jesus was alive. If we can reject the ego's desire to compare and control and acquire more and more, if we turn to one another and see each other as human beings, as brothers and sisters, not separate but bound together in this mad but beautiful world, then I don't think we have a conflict in doing what is good and just. We can do more than just rearrange the chairs on the deck. This is our society today. It looks a lot like the time in which Jesus lived, where we have that top percent making most of the decisions in the bottom 85% being unrepresented. It's, I think, our imperative to represent all of those in the bottom 85% because the deal is when all of us are included, it benefits everyone. So how do we create a community of empowerment with this, within this structure? We, we, uh, currently seem to lack the imagination. I think we're capable of it. We are a really creative species. Mm -hmm. But as you say, fear, anger, pain keeps us immobile sometimes. You know, I was, I was reading this morning, today's the birthday of Molly Ivins. Yeah, really? Yeah. Happy birthday, Molly Ivins. <laughs> well, she's no longer with That's us. That's right, she died a couple of years but ago. Molly uh, had a wonderful solution for the gun problem, mm -hmm. and that is that um, take the guns away and make everybody commit crimes with knives. For one thing, it would improve the physical health of the population because you'd have to run more to catch up with somebody you wanted to stab. And uh, she goes on and on and on about it. She says, nobody's ever, ever been killed cleaning a knife. Yeah, <laughs> That's, maybe they've sliced off a finger. But, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. But we, you know, every time that over the past that <clears throat> I've tried to speak to this issue, made comparisons between the Roman Empire and American culture, and, and appealed to, to the fact that um, though this structure is designed to fail. It's designed to support the, the minority. Well, it, it's, it's, 
and therefore it's meaning the minority of the population, right. not and, the, and, yeah. and, and yeah. therefore it's designed not right. eventually not to work yeah. because what you're going to have is what you got today, which are people who are scared, mm -hmm. and I'm not talking about people on the, on the right or the left. I'm talking about everybody who's been affected by the economic downturn yeah. are frightened and angry. And so we have these wells of anger and, and fear that we need to get through somehow so that we can imagine a, a different um, kind of culture. Mm -hmm. So I want to, uh, you, you can do that. Okay. I, I, I want to, um, I, I want to explore what it means to be poor in spirit. And I want to read you this, this passage by H.O. Mencken. You know who he was, right? Mm H.O. -hmm. Mencken was considered, he came to be considered one of the more influential writers in the part of the 19th century. He's the guy who wrote about the Scopes trial in Tennessee. And he came up with a phrase, he called it the monkey trial. And he's, he was a very funny uh, writer, humorist in many ways. But he wrote these words. Moral certainty is always a sign of cultural inferiority. Think about fundamentalism in light of that particular line. Mm -hmm. And think about the fact that <clears throat> the opposite of real faith is not doubt, it's certitude. Moral certainty is always a sign of cultural inferiority. The more uncivilized the person, the surer he or she is that he knows precisely what's right and what's wrong. All human progress, even in morals, has been the work of people who have doubted the current moral values, not of people who have whooped them up and tried to enforce them. The truly civilized person is always skeptical and tolerant in this field as in all others. This person's culture is based on, I'm not too sure. So I want to keep the question that some of his followers put into the mouth of Jesus. I don't think Jesus himself ever said it, but it became central to the faith of people who followed Jesus. Who do you say that I am? And who is the you who answers that question? If you get the Richard Rohr Daily Meditations, you know that this is going to be his theme for this week, differentiating between the true self and the small self and uh, between the self and the ego, as it were, so to speak. Im very important thing. And I want to keep raising, as a people who say that we are committed to following the teachings of Jesus, who are we? And how are we to live? How are we to shape our lives and the communities in which we live? So in these talks, we are attempting to hang out with Jesus. You know where he hung? We got to see this painting by Dolly in the mm. museum in uh, Glasgow, mm. Scotland, a couple mm. of years ago. Um, Dolly is, um, Salvador Dolly, I don't know what you as an artist think of his work. Oh, I think he's phenomenal and also, um, how would he, I'm not, it's not gory, he's not the one I'm looking for, but you know, he had a, definite mind trip going on. I mean, the inner world of dreams, et cetera, that he attempted to paint. This is a powerful painting. Really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, it, it, it really is a powerful piece to stand in front of. It's a huge piece. Mm -hmm. And um, so we got to see this in, in uh, Glasgow. So we're called to hang in the space between the contradictions, the tension of paradox, um, I, this is why I love the lines uh, by Jim Wallace when he says, don't go right, don't go left, go deep. Spiritual work involves going deep. It, it, it involves living in that space because if we rest on one side or the other, we're going to lose the truth. Over the years, I've seen some people in religious practices who have been so rigid in their either beliefs or behaviors or both that there has been no real joy in their practice. They've not, they've not been happy. Their certitude makes them angry. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that I, I, I love it when somebody points out that Jesus didn't answer questions. Mm. He was not an answer machine. 
he um, asked more questions, far more. So what we have right now in this country, in the religion that's so popular in this country, is such an emphasis on victory and prosperity that there's almost no reference to the pain and suffering that's in the world. All the focus is on prosperity and victory and how we need to be protected. It's a religion that leaves little room for that dark space where the sacred can meet us and tell us in our poverty who we really are and what we are called to do. So I want to warn you, and I, I tell people who come to me for spiritual direction this, my goal, um, my first spiritual teacher said, my, my job is to knock you off a path and your work is to get back on. And in that getting back on, you'll learn what you come here to, to learn. So I want to warn you that my goal is to open up the space where we feel and experience, we feel and experience that there is so little to hold on to so that we can fall into the living, loving hands of this sacred mystery. That's faith. That's trust. I think one of the things it means, at least for us, to say, blessed are the poor, is to get it. That our worth and God's love for us have absolutely nothing to do with what we've earned, with our deserving it, or earning it in any way whatsoever. Our worth comes not because of who we are, but because of whose we are. I believe that we have to work for the happiness, for the being blessed of those who do not have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So during this week, um, I was really, really touched by an interview with Doc Rivers. We saw this on the news last night. Yeah. Um, so in, in, this, in this NBA bubble, all of the interviews that occur, um, folks are wearing masks. But at this point in the interview with Doc Rivers, he literally just ripped off his mask. Just you could see the weariness. I think he wanted folks to see the expression and the emotion in his face. How old do you think he is? He's in his 60s. Okay. I think I'm right about that. Um, but he's a legendary coach. People love him. And he's a former player. But in this passionate and heartbroken response to the boycott, to what he thought of it, he says, and this is his quote, all you hear is Trump talking about fear, but we're the ones getting killed. We're the ones getting shot. We're the ones that are denied to live in certain communities. We've been hung, we've been shot, and all you do is keep hearing about fear. It's amazing why we keep loving this country and this country does not love us back. It is really so sad. My dad was a cop. I believe in good cops. We're not trying to defund the police and take all the money away. We're trying to get them to protect us just like they protect everyone else. That video, and he's referring to the Jacob Blake video, if you watch that video, you don't need to be black to be outraged. You need to be American and outraged. So, you know, what he's calling for is not for us to identify with a party, one side or the other, but to identify with the humanity, the humanity of people like him. He has some really harrowing stories over the course of his life and becoming an NBA player and things that he's undergone, just like someone like Dusty Baker, the coach of the Astros. He, too, has been in this profession for 50 years, and he has experienced so much so much injustice in his life that he said it would take hours to recount all of it. I would add to his quote that if we identify as Christian, as followers of Jesus, we need to be outraged. Unlike Jesus, Doc Rivers is financially probably in the top 5%, but like Jesus, he identifies with the poor and expendable, and he is using his station to speak and act on that behalf. This body that I grew up in cannot fully relate to his bodily experience, nor to any black person's. I've not been called racial slurs, but as a mother to brown-skinned boys, I completely understand and hold close what he and so many others speak to. There is so much pain. I've seen more 
black men on TV, announcers, uh, people who are involved in business, athletes cry this week than I've ever seen in my life. I've seen friends cry, just weep. And I think this release is so needed. Our imperative, I think, is to respond to this pain, to upend the social stratosphere and identify with the pain. And that too needs to flow through us like a river. This is not a new narrative. Societies have been constructed in hierarchies for ages. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus shows us this way to transform them in favor of participation and inclusion. He shows us how to be a mystic in action, and I'm quoting this, the mystical becoming belongs together with the clear, loud speech of the no of resistance. We cannot afford to confuse wealth with morality, but we can use our wealth, however it comes to us, whether it's because of our station just granted to us in life or because of our actual dollar amount of wealth, we can demand that morality serves the 80%. And here's the deal, as I said before, if it serves the 80%, it serves everyone. An acquaintance of mine who's a brilliant scholar, Dr. Biko Mandela Gray, he's a professor at Syracuse University in New York. He wrote recently in a paper, the ethical move almost always costs too much. This should not be. I think it's what Jesus is asking us to choose between, our morality and our pocketbooks. The cost in dollars might at times be more to choose what is right, but the spiritual and the social rewards are great. And frankly, the more people we have participating fully in society and in an economic system, the healthier it is. This is what I think we call unity and diversity. When everyone has access to participation, Things work more in harmony. So, um, St. Francis is alleged to have said, always preach the gospel, mm. sometimes use words. Mm -hmm. So, a way that I preach the gospel is uh, by wearing t-shirts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I have a wide variety of t-shirts, you know, one that says, make America intelligent again. One that says, um, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. I should get you a copy. You should get me the one that says a lot. <laughs> and my kids will be like, yep. <laughs> um, and, and, and really, some of the t-shirts I wear are really pretty edgy. But it's a way to get the message out there, right? Mm -hmm. Get people to think. So people always ask, where do you get these t-shirts? And the, the, my answer is the best source of t-shirts like the ones that I wear is an organization called the Northern Sun. Mm. And they put out all these t-shirts that are geared toward people who sort of are on the left side of things or people who are fiercely in favor of ecological stuff and mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Great, great t-shirts. And so this week I got a catalog mm -hmm. and there was a t-shirt in it that I don't have yet. Aha. Uh -huh. Bill's birthday is next Sunday. <laughs> Treat racism like COVID-19. Assume you have it. Listen to the experts. Don't spread it. Be willing to change your life to end it. This was on someone's protest sign. Oh, really? Yeah, a white man's protest sign. Oh, mm -hmm. I thought it was just on a t-shirt. Well, Maybe I don't know which came first. It could, it's a chicken and egg. The issue. chicken and the egg. Yeah. This culturally, this country is divided because we're out of balance. Our division makes us out of balance. And on, on the one side is a kind of cheap romantic notion about life. And um, I put most liberals in that group. Most progressives are in that group. This is why I say, please beware of labels. Don't embrace one because it's a trap. Any label you put on yourself is a trap. On the other side, there's kind of a shallow rationalism, and I put most conservatives and fundamentalists into that demographic. And consequently, rather than conversing about things, rather than dealing with things, we just react. We react to each other. And a healthy spirituality is going to embrace both idealism and reason, faith and intellect, symbol and science, experience and science. 
Both liberals and conservatives are, in my mind, virtually incapable of self-criticism or of appreciating the other's point of view. Um, so often when people disagree with what I have to say, uh, it's a reaction. I disagree with, or they get up and walk out, or whatever. And it's not, did I understand you correctly? Or what did you mean when? And it gives us a chance to really talk about what's, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Because my goal is to heal, not to put apart. Yeah. But there's so often the, the, the what do you want to say, the destruction that comes before healing and that happens interior in our interior world too. Like something has to fly apart right. in order to come back together. Right. So, you know, I, I agree with both conservatives and uh, liberals that there has been a major erosion of our institutions over the past 50 years or so. And what we've been left with, at least in this country, is only the media and the market to give meaning. This is the first time in hu human history when we've reached this point. And I, I, I started thinking about when this happened, and I'm thinking somewhere around 1968, and maybe we'll have a chance in the Sundays coming up to talk about that, but there's been a shift in, in this country. And the scary thing about the metaphor of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic uh, is that the Titanic sank. <laughs> And I've come to believe that that's a real possibility for this country. We can sink. Our, our traditional institutions are impotent to lead us with wisdom and truth. They lack both authority and credibility. We are in a profound need for wisdom. But even if it were to come, we're too divided to have a consensus of the confidence to listen to it and, and, and to take it. I have seen over the past 20 years among the people I talk to, listen to, observe that there is a growing sense of cynicism. I think about the, since the war in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, you remember weapons of mass destruction? Mm -hmm. The unending but apparently inconsequential scandals of our current president. Um, people are becoming more and more cynical about government. The conservatives are saying, oh, well, what can you expect? Mm -hmm. And the liberals are feeling, I feel powerless to do anything about this. This is hopeless. Um, the, the matter of murder of George Floyd began to bring attention to the similar killings that have been going on for decades and continued to go on to this very moment, making a growing percentage of our population cynical about the judicial system, cynical about policing, and more. I asked someone, I think it was you. Mm -hmm. was what happened that? to the policeman who shot Jacob Blake? And you said? He got reassigned to um, desk duty. He's on administrative leave. Because? Um, generally speaking, that there is an institutional belief that we look out for each other. And, I thought, with, and I thought yeah. just the way bishops protected pedophile priests. And it happens in teaching, too. And it happens yeah. in teaching. It happens yeah. in... It happens uh, in government. It happens on when we, we protect our tribe. Right. And that's, that's what it is, right? Our universities are designed to create universal people, but what they've done is create students, as Holly said a minute ago, who can't afford to go to school, whose debt is $70,000 when they leave. More than that. <laughs> uh, the narcissism and individualism of our culture, of our entertainment, have not given people the skills that they need to be in viable, life-enhancing relationships, marriages, committed relationships. A vacuum of genuine power and authority and confidence has been created that has left a door open so wide that the far political right and religious movements have been able to seize and exploit the language of religions and religious institutions themselves. Um, what I hear mostly in the media is attacking and prote protecting, and that leaves very little room to focus on either true intelligence or authentic mysticism. Anytime someone takes an extreme position, what they do is push the other side to the opposite extreme. Uh, another word for this condition is that we are poverty stricken. We are poverty stricken in the values 
that undergird and guide both individuals and society in a healthy way. When a marriage is in trouble, and I, I will claim that I'm an expert in this, I know about this, what's my training and, and what, what I do when a marriage is in trouble, I can tell you almost before a couple walks in the room that they're competing with each other for who's right. Mm. It's your fault. No, it's not. Yes, it is. <laughs> my question to everyone is, how are you complicit? Right. In this being the way it is. And I'd ask that of, of conservatives and liberals, how are you complicit in creating this system that is so dysfunctional, that is dangerously dysfunctional? Compassion and humility are hard to sell currently in this culture, but I believe they are our only hope. Hostile situations never have a good outcome. There are only a few things that I keep coming back to in my teaching over and over. Um, one is that God is not out there. Please know that. Holly says it so beautifully. God is embedded in our lives, in our hearts, in our culture. Our work is to see that, to experience it, and to express it. If we're committed to being right and winning, if we spend our, it, what, what a, God is not out there. And the other thing I want to say is how you do anything is how you do yes. everything. Yeah. So if we are committed to winning and being right, if we spend our time controlling and blocking others, what is going to be our stance when we stop and pray or when we enter a time of contemplative space? We're going to try to control. We're going to try to win. And the sacred doesn't have a chance with us. The other thing that you say so often is what you don't transform, you transmit. You transmit. Right. And if we keep passing the same old thing down, the same old thing is going to keep happening, and that's insanity. We've got to come to present, in the, into the presence of sacred mystery with our hands empty. Yeah. So... Blessed are you when you're at the end of your rope. Blessed are you when you have nothing to hang on to. Blessed are the poor, for they shall enter the community of empowerment. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step. And Holly Hudley, I love you and thank you for doing this with me. I love you too, Bill Curley. <laughs> we'll see you next week.